A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, Chapter 9 Johnny and Katie were married and went to live on a quiet side street in Williamsburg called Bogart Street. Johnny chose the street because its name had a thrilling dark sound. They were very, very happy there that first year of their marriage. Katie had married Johnny because she liked the way he sang and danced and dressed. Woman-like, she set about changing all those things in him after marriage. She persuaded him to give up the singing waiter business. He did so since he was in love and anxious to please her. They got a job together taking care of a public school and they loved it. Their day started when the rest of the world went to bed. After supper, Katie put on her black coat with the big leg of mutton sleeves lavishly trimmed with braid, her last loot from the factory, and threw a cherry wool fascinator over her head, a newbie she called it, and she and Johnny set off to work. The school was old and small and warm. They looked forward to spending the night there. They walked arm in arm, he in his patent leather dancing shoes and she in her high lace kid boots. Sometimes when the night was frosty and full of stars, they ran a little, skipped a little and laughed a lot. They felt very important using their private key to get into the school. The school was their world for a night. They played games while they worked. Johnny sat on one of the desks and Katie pretended she was a teacher. They wrote messages to each other on the blackboards. They pulled down the maps which rolled up like shades and pointed out foreign countries with the rubber tip pointer. They were filled with wonder at the thought of strange lands and unknown languages. He was 19 and she was 17. They liked best to clean the assembly room. Johnny dusted the piano and while doing so ran his finger over the keys. He picked out some chords. Katie sat in the front row and asked him to sing. He sang to her, sentimental songs of the time. She may have seen better days, or I'm wearing my heart away over you. People living nearby would be coaxed out of their midnight sleep by the singing. They'd lie in their warm beds, listening drowsily, and murmur to each other. That feller, whoever he is, is losing time. He's losing time. He ought to be in a show. Sometimes Johnny went into one of his dances on the little platform that he pretended was a stage. He was so graceful and handsome, so loving, so full of grandness of just living, that Katie watched him and thought she would die of being happy. At two, they went into the teacher's lunchroom where there was a gas plate. They made coffee. They kept a can of condensed milk in the cupboard. They enjoyed the boiling hot coffee which filled the room with a wonderful smell. Their rye bread and bologna sandwiches tasted good. Sometimes after supper, they'd go into the teacher's restroom where there was a chintz-covered couch and lie there for a while with their arms about each other. They emptied the waste paper baskets last thing, and Katie salvaged the longer bits of discarded chalk and the pencils that were not too stubby. She took them home and saved them in a box. Later, when Francie was growing up, she felt very rich having so much chalk and so many pencils to use. At dawn, they left the school scrubbed, shiny, warm, and ready for the daytime janitor. They walked home watching the stars fade from the sky. They passed the bakers where the smell of freshly baked rolls came up to them from the baking room in the basement. Johnny ran down and bought a nickel's worth of buns hot from the oven. Arriving home, they had a breakfast of hot coffee and warm sweet buns. Then Johnny ran out and got the morning American and read the news to her with running comments while she cleaned up their rooms. At noon, they had a hot dinner of pot roast and noodles or something good like that. And after dinner, they slept until it was time to get up for work. They earned $50 a month, which was good pay for people of their class in those days. They lived comfortably and it was a good life they had, happy and full of small adventures. They were so young and loved each other so much. In a few months, to their innocent amazement and consternation, Katie found out that she was pregnant. She told Johnny that she was that way. Johnny was bewildered and confused at first. He didn't want her to work at the school. She told him she had been that way for quite a while without being sure and had been working and had not suffered. When she convinced him that it was good for her to work, he gave in. She continued working until she got too unwieldy to dust under the desks. Soon she could do little more than go along with him for company and lie on the gay couch no longer used for lovemaking. 
He did all the work now. At two in the morning, he made clumsy sandwiches and overboiled coffee for her. They were still very happy, although Johnny was getting more and more worried as the time went on. Towards the end of a frosty December night, her pain started. She lay on the couch, holding them back, not wanting to tell Johnny until the work was finished. On the way home, there was a tearing pain that she couldn't keep back. She moaned and Johnny knew that the baby was on the way. He got her home and put her to bed without undressing her and covered her warmly. He ran down the block to Mrs. Gindler's, the midwife, and begged her to hurry. The, that good woman drove him crazy, taking her time. She had to take dozens of curlers out of her hair. She couldn't find her teeth and refused to officiate without them. Johnny helped her search. They found them at last in a glass of water on the ledge outside the window. The water had frozen around the teeth and they had to be thawed before she could put them in. That done, she had to go about making a charm out of a piece of blessed palm taken from the altar on Palm Sunday. To this, she added a medal of the Blessed Mother, a small blue bird feather, a broken blade from a pen knife, and a sprig of some herb. These things were tied together with a bit of dirty string from the corset of a woman who had given birth to twins after only 10 minutes of labor. She sprinkled the whole business with holy water that was supposed to have come from a well in Jerusalem from which it was said that Jesus had once quenched his thirst. She explained to the frantic boy that this charm would cut the pains and assure him a fine well-born baby. Lastly, she grabbed her crocodile satchel, familiar to everyone in the neighborhood and believed by all the youngsters to be the satchel in which they had, they had been delivered kicking to their mothers, and she was ready to go. Katie was screaming in pain when they got to her. The flat was filled with neighbor women who stood around praying and reminiscing about their own childbed experiences. When I had my Vincent, said one, I, I was even smaller than her, said another woman. And when they didn't expect me to come through it, proudly declared a third, but they welcomed the midwife and shooed Johnny out of the place. He sat on the stoop and trembled each time Katie cried out. He was confused. It had happened so suddenly. It was now seven in the morning. Her screams kept coming to him through the window, though the windows were closed. Men passed on their way to work, looked at the window from behind which the screams were coming, and then looked at Johnny huddled on the stoop, and a somber look came over their faces. Katie was in labor all that day and there was nothing that Johnny could do. Nothing that he could do. Towards night, he couldn't stand it any longer. He went to his mother's house for comforting. When he told her that Katie was having a baby, she nearly raised the roof with her lamentations. Now she's got you good, she wailed. You'll never be able to come back to me. She would not be consoled. Johnny hunted up his brother Georgie, who was working a dance. He sat drinking, waiting for Georgie to finish forgetting he was supposed to be at the school. When Georgie was free for the night, they went to several all-night saloons, had a drink or two at each place and told everyone what Johnny was going through. The men listened sympathetically, treated Johnny to drinks, and assured him that they had been through the same mill. Towards dawn, the boys went to their mother's house where Johnny fell into a troubled sleep. At nine, he woke up with a feeling of coming trouble. He remembered Katie, and too late, he remembered the school. He washed and dressed and started for home. He passed a fruit stand which displayed avocados. He bought two for Katie. He had no way of knowing that during the night, his wife, in great pain, and after nearly 24 hours of labor, gave bloody birth to a fragile baby girl. The only notable thing about the girl was that the infant was born with a call, which is supposed to indicate that the child was set apart to do great things in the world. The midwife surreptitiously confiscated the call and later sold it to a sailor from the Brooklyn Navy Yard for $2. Whoever wore a call would never die by drowning, it was said. The sailor wore it in a flannel bag around his neck. While he drank and slept the night away, Johnny did not know that the, that night had turned cold and that the school fires which he was supposed to tend had gone out and the water pipes had burst and flooded the school basement and first floor. 
When he got home, he found Katie lying in the dark bedroom. The baby was beside her on Andy's pillow. The flat was scrupulously clean. The neighbor women had attended to that. There was a faint odor of carbolic acid mixed with Menon's talcum powder. The midwife had gone saying, that will be $5 and your husband knows where I live. She left and Katie turned her face to the wall and tried not to cry. During the night, she had assured herself that Johnny was working at the school. She had hoped that he would run home for a moment during the two o'clock eating period. Now it was late in the morning and he should be home. Maybe he had gone to his mother's to snatch some sleep after the night's work. She made herself believe that no matter what Johnny was doing, it was all right and that his explanation would set her mind at ease. Soon after the midwife left, Evie came over. A neighbor's boy had been sent for her. Evie brought along some sweet butter and a package of soda crackers and made tea. It tasted so good to Katie. Evie examined the baby and thought it didn't look like much, but she said nothing to Katie. When Johnny got home, Evie started to lecture him, but when she saw how pale and frightened he looked, and when she considered his age, just 20 years old, she choked up inside. Kissed his cheek, told him not to worry, and made fresh coffee for him. Johnny hardly looked at the baby. Still clutching the avocados, he knelt by Katie's bed and sobbed out his fear and worry. Katie cried with him. During the night, she had wanted him with her. Now she wished she could have had the baby secretly and gone away somewhere when it was over and came back to tell him that everything was fine. She had had the pain. It had been like being boiled alive in scalding oil and not being able to die to get free of it. She had had the pain, dear God. Wasn't that enough? Why did he have to suffer? He wasn't put together for suffering, but she was. She had borne a child but two hours ago. She was so weak that she couldn't lift her head an inch from the pillow. Yet it was she who comforted him and told him not to worry, that she would take care of him. Johnny began to feel better. He told her that after all it was nothing, and he had learned for, that a lot of husbands had been through the mill. I've been through the mill now too. Now I'm a man. He made a big fuss over the baby then. At his suggestion, Katie agreed to name her Francie after the girl Francie Mullaney, who had never married his brother Andy. They thought it would help her to mend her broken heart if she were godmother. The child would have the name she would have carried had Andy lived, Francie Nolan. He fixed the avocados with sweet oil and pickled vinegar and brought the salad to Katie. She was disappointed at the flat taste. Johnny said you had to get used to it, like olives. For his sake, and because she was touched by his thinking of her, Katie ate the salad. Evie was urged to try some. She did, and said that she'd sooner have tomatoes. While Johnny was in the kitchen drinking coffee, a boy came from the school with a note from the principal that said Johnny was fired because of neglect. He was told to come around and get what money was due him. The note ended by telling Johnny not to ask for a recommendation. Johnny's face got pale as he read it. He gave the kid a nickel for bringing the note and a message saying he would be around. He destroyed the note and said nothing to Katie. Johnny saw the principal and tried to explain. The principal told Johnny that since he knew the baby was coming, he should have been more careful about his job. As a kindly afterthought, he told the boy that he wouldn't have to pay the damage caused by the bust pipes. The Board of Education would see to that. Johnny thanked him. The principal paid him for, out of his own pocket after Johnny signed a voucher, turning over the coming paycheck to the principal. All in all, the principal did the best he could according to the way he saw things. Johnny paid the midwife, gave the landlord next month's rent, he got a little frightened when he realized that now there was a baby and that Katie could, wouldn't be strong enough to do much for quite some time and that they were out of a job. He consoled himself finally with the thought that the rent was paid and they were safe for 30 days. Surely something would turn up in that time. In the afternoon, he walked over to tell Mary Romilly about the new baby. On the way there, he stopped at the rubber factory and asked for Sissy's foreman. He asked the man to tell her about the baby and would she stop over after work. The foreman said he would. 
winked, poked Johnny in the ribs, and said, Good for you, Mac. Johnny grinned, gave him ten cents with instructions, buy a good cigar and smoke it on me. I'll do that, Mac, promised the foreman. He pumped Johnny's hand again and again promised to tell Sissy. Mary Romilly wept when she heard the news. The poor child, the poor little one, she lamented. Born into this world of sorrow, born for suffering and hardship. Aye, there'll be a little happiness, but more of hard work. Aye, aye. Johnny was all for telling Thomas Romilly, but Mary begged him not to just yet. Thomas hated Johnny because he was Irish. He hated the Germans. He hated Americans. He hated the Russians, but he just couldn't stand the Irish. He was fiercely racial in spite of his stupendous hatred of his race, and he had a theory that marriage between two alien races would result in mongrel children. What should I get if I made it a canary with a crow, was his argument. 